Good evening. Good evening. Good evening and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Vanessa Varden. I am the director of the Chicago Forum on Global Cities here at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. It is my pleasure to welcome everyone for tonight's program, The New Localism, How Cities Can Thrive in the Age of Populism, with Bruce Katz and Jeremy Nowak, moderated by the Council's Director of Global Cities, Juliana Kerr. Copies of their book by the same title will be available for sale and signing after the program right over here um, from our partners, the bookseller. Today's program is part of the Council's work on global cities where we conduct research and promote a multidisciplinary dialogue on the power and limitations of global cities. Please save the date for the 2018 Chicago Forum on Global Cities scheduled for June 6th through 8th. This signature annual forum brings together world leaders in Chicago to discuss the important role of cities across multiple dimensions. Visit chicagoforum.org for continued updates, registration, and access to le the live streams of all the panels. Also, please mark your calendars for June 14th when we will host our next Global Cities program in partnership with the World Bank on urban violence in the Americas, exploring intervention strategies to reduce homicide rates in cities across the Americas. Before we start, please note the Council is an independent, nonpartisan platform Views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the council. Today's program is on the record and being live streamed, so please silence your phones, but keep them handy as we will be taking questions through our online survey technology, the link to which you can find on the screens on either side of me, it'll rotate through. It's chi.cnf.io. Um, type that into your web-enabled device browser and select tonight's program to submit your questions for consideration. Uh, for tonight, we are honored to partner with the Metropolitan Planning Council for this program, a long-standing partner of both our annual forum and our year-long cities work. I'd like to welcome to the stage the Metropolitan Planning Commission's board chair, Todd Brown, to frame tonight's discussion and formally introduce our speakers. Thank you, Vanessa, and welcome everybody this evening. What I think this is going to be a, a really informative and engaging discussion. Um, on behalf of the Metropolitan Planning Council and the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, it's my pleasure to welcome Bruce Katz and Jerry, Jeremy Nowak to the stage this evening. For more than 80 years, MPC has provided sound urban, urban planning solutions to our region's toughest challenges. The research, technical assistance and advocacy, we have been an independent and trusted change agent to make our region more equitable, more prosperous, more sustainable, and participatory. Both MPC and the Council seek to promote a dialogue on the power and limitations of our city and all global cities to shape the world's future. Of course, our speakers share this passion with us. Bruce Katz served as the Vice President and Director of Brookings Metropolitan Policy Program for more than 20 years. He previously served as Chief of Staff to the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development and co-led the Obama Administration's Housing and Urban Development Transition Team. Bruce has written, edited, or co-edited several books on urban and metropolitan issues. Jeremy Nowak is a distinguished fellow at Drexel University's Lindy Institute for Urban in in Innovation. Previously, he was the founder of the Re Reinvestment Fund and the chair of the board of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. He currently serves on the board of the University City Science Center, the advisory board of the University of Pennsylvania's Institute for Urban Research, and is chair of the investment committee for Spring Point Partners. Tonight's discussion will be moderated by Juliana Kerr, the Council Director of Global Cities and Immigration. Please join me in welcoming our speakers to the stage. Good evening. Good evening, and thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm very excited to be having this conversation with Bruce and Jeremy on the new localism, uh, very much in tune with our Global Cities agenda here at the Chicago Council. Um, there is clearly a lot of emphasis on cities having solutions to all the big global challenges our world is facing. 
Uh, the problems are really felt acutely at the city level, and so who better to have this conversation of how they're actually going to achieve their goals, finance, and develop the uh, infrastructure needed to, to achieve these goals. Um, we are going to start with Bruce. Um, I have a copy here of the book. Bruce has been writing on cities for as long as I've been studying cities. And so for me, the big question I have is really what's the new part on this new localism agenda? Uh, you have written the Metropolitan Revolution, you've started all these programs, and I'd love to just dive in on, sure. on the new element that you're seeing today. Um, well, first of all, I just want to thank uh, Mary Sue and Ebo for inviting us here today. And these are two great organizations uh, that represent really social capital and civic capacity and reflect the new localism. So it, it's great to be here. Um, so first thing that's new about the new localism is I wrote it with this guy. Um, <laughs> and that was uh, a hell of a lot of fun. Um, so if you're gonna, if you're gonna you know, go through this masochistic act of writing a book, um, you better do it with someone <laughs> you enjoy doing it with. Um, I, I would say that what's new, obviously we can talk about the urgency of the moment, whether it's in the United States or or in Europe or other parts of the world, I, I think what was new for us was to really try to think through not just a sort of a general framework, um, you know, or general narrative, or the, the celebration of mayors and you know, all, all the other stakeholders in cities, but to really get more granular about what are these norms and models of growth, governance, and finance that are emerging around the world. Uh, what are the new kinds of public-private or private-public or private-civic institutions that are able to harness um, you know, capital to, to make transformative investments in their places, to some extent to compensate for the withdrawal of higher levels of government? And, and how do we begin to productize this? I mean, I, I think we're in a structural shift. This is not a cyclical moment. This is not just that we elected the prime narcissist in the, in the world to be our president, you know, or that you know, the British went completely mad on a referendum day and voted to get out of the European Union. I mean, I mean this is a structural shift of who solves problems in the world and how do you finance solutions. Um, and so we were really trying to get as granular as we could get without boring the hell out of everyone um, because then no one would read it. Um, but so that we could begin to capture and codify new models and then adapt and adopt them uh, through cities across the world and through markets, through you know, civic institutions. Uh, we're, we think we're at the beginning of a different kind of phase in problem solving in the world. And so I think that was what was new. Mm -hmm. I mean, Metropolitan Revolution, written about four or five years ago, set out this frame that cities are going to be the vanguard of problem solving in the world. This book tried to get, okay, what does that actually mean with depth and, and specificity so that we can begin to, um, you know, not just celebrate a few moves by a few cities, but actually make this the norm. So you, and just to follow up on that, because you do spell out, you know, the need for new leaders and new institutions for this right. disruptive era. Can you give an example of a new institution? And we're going to talk about financing later, but if you could just talk about structural architecture, it would be helpful. Yeah, so, you know, I, I, it's, it's hard to say there, some of these are new institutions, because we were really looking for proven models. Because in a way, what you, you know, we can all do the press release of the month or, the, or even the year, and then it was, oh, we've got a new kind of solution here. We were looking for models that were seasoned over the course of 20 or 30 or 40 years so we could say that there's been that kind of return on investment, market investment, social investment, problem solving. So, you know, one of the most interesting models that we discovered um, mostly out of Northern Europe is this publicly owned, professionally managed, privately driven corporation that has emerged in places like Copenhagen, the city and port development corporation, or Hamburg, Hafen City, where basically they're taking all the assets that the government owns, whether it's the national government, whether it's the local government, whether it's special authorities, and they're putting it under the aegis of one corporation, publicly owned, the mayor's the chair of the board, um, but it's professionally managed because the yield from the smart disposition of assets goes to build infrastructure. So if you go to Copenhagen today, how many people have been to Copenhagen? So quite a few. You've been <laughs> cycling, you know, you all. But the subway system that they built in Copenhagen, not a kroner of taxes, right? 
not a kroner of taxes. They have financed their entire subway system through land sales and land leases. And Copenhagen 30 years ago had 18% unemployment and was fiscally bankrupt. We do not do this in the United States. We do not have publicly owned, professionally managed corporations that can have that kind of transformative effect on their cities. Imagine in the New York, New Jersey Port Authority was managed like the Copenhagen City and Port Development Corporation. Have you been to the New York subway recently? I mean, we might actually put a little more investment back in from all the value appreciation we have. So this stuff can sound like boring financing stuff and boring institutional mechanics, but at the end of the day, if we want to take control and power our country forward, we're gonna have to find new revenue sources in the tens if not the hundreds of billions of dollars to invest in innovation and infrastructure and inclusion and the model out of Copenhagen and Hamburg, or Hong Kong, or Singapore, is the model we're going to have to adapt and adopt in the United States. Hard to do, but what other choice do we have? So I think that's the kind, that's what we were looking for. Mm -hmm. We were not looking for just rhetoric, or a press release of the day, or we've, you know, 2,000 mayors signed up for something. Not entirely sure what it was, but we signed up to do it. We're looking for institutions. Although that's great too. No, when that's we do great get too. Them to do that. <laughs> but we're looking for institutions, public, private, and civic, that can actually design, finance, and deliver the kind of investments that we need. Great. We're, we're going to come back to the financing. Um, I wanted to bring in Jeremy, though, because the subtitle of the book uh, is How Cities Can Thrive in the Age of Populism. And uh, Bruce gave me a heads up that that was, you know, the populism component of the timeliness of this book is uh, something that you could comment on. Sure. Um, first, again, thank you for inviting us. Um, I, I, let me just say two things as a bridge from what Bruce said and sure. to the populism part. Mm -hmm. So the subtext here is a, it's more of a text than a subtext, is that there's this, as Bruce suggested, there's this structural change that happened. And part one aspect of the structural change is that the role of the nation state in a period of globalization is going through some significant change, right? So we don't know exactly what that means. It's playing out in different ways, in different places, in Europe, in Asia, and in the US. But at that point, as that happens, there is this convergence of the global and the local. And the meaning of that, which you know, gets to who you guys are, is I think really profound to think about because I, that is happening everywhere. So global and local are converging in new ways. Um, and that is not, as Bruce suggested, a cyclical issue, but a structural shift, which we don't know what that, exactly what that will mean. Uh, secondly, I think related to that, and I think as a, as a way to um, frame the conversation, and then I promise I'll get right to populism, is that for us, local is not, I think when you use the term local or localism, there's a tendency to think about local government. And local government is, of course, important. But for us, local is not reducible to government. For us, local or localism is the sort of relationships, very complex relationships, which again play out differently in different places between public, private, civic, academic. So it's, it's something that's going on, and it, 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 in some places it appears to be a type of emerging co-governance that's emerging. And we can sort of talk about whether that's good, bad, but it, from our perspective, it's what's happening. It's how places are being you know, refashioned and redeveloped. Populism is an expression, obviously, of political grievance. And, and those grievances are real and understandable. And there's a populism to the left and a populism to the right. One plays much more, is much more interested and much more aware of the changing roles of labor versus capital. Uh, one is much more concerned with national sovereignty and cultural issues. Um, and it all, in some ways, is a product of the fact that over the last 30 or 40 years, everything changed, including uh, the competitiveness of some places and some industries. And one day, I mean, we sort of know from our own elections, but you know, one day, it, it, you know, Youngstown was no longer a manufacturing place that sort of worked, or you know, part of the Midlands in the UK, again, no longer were, you know, had that kind of competitiveness. And you get this, particularly at a time of technological change, you get this enormous um, 
divergence in income, enormous inequity in income. And so for us, new localism, which again, as Bruce noted, is a problem solving um, uh, issue, was, is the other side of populism. So populism is political grievance, although there are periods of populism that can also result in great institution building, important legislative changes. But for us, um, what we saw when we started to write this book, we kind of looked at the chaos sometime around November, December 2016. And like some other people in this room, we were probably, when we talked about writing the book, we were in the third stages of grief or something, right? <laughs> and what, what really happened for us was that we juxtaposed that chaos, which you can flip on cable TV every night and you know see. We juxtaposed that to the really positive things that were happening. Not to be Pollyannish, we're many things, but Pollyannish wouldn't be one of them. And, but what we saw were these remarkable things happening in places. And we wanted to try to understand why that was and why these things were happening locally. And so this was really a book about the juxtaposition of political grievance, which is understandable in many instances. This country's gotten really good at grievance, right? With solutions. And so that's really the kind of play in the book. So it, um, I think that that's great. But um, I know that in our work, we were looking at cities. Cities is kind of part of the backlash, right, with the populist movement. Yeah. Um, is there any chance that the nucleism agenda could also have, like, be at risk of being elitist and, and not serve to the, you know, the, the agenda um, that the populist would, would want to achieve? So sure, it depends on the type of populism, right? Um, so populism. Um, often views, there's, a, there's again, a populism of the left and a populism of the right, and they play different kinds of roles. Uh, and they have different perspectives. They tend to come together around a couple things, manufacturing and trade agreements seem to be the, what they you know, most uh, agree on. They both have the view of the nation state and of the role of the economy and what the economy of the nation state is which is more in keeping with the 1950s and 1960s than what is reality right now. Uh, both of them have really had a hard time dealing with those realities. Both of them, both types of populism, understandably represent people who feel like um, they need some other institutional form of mediation between them and the global marketplace. Again, really important uh, stuff. Um, for the populace of the right or often see cities as places that are, you know, not of the national culture in the same way, you know, all these different kinds of, you know, people in, uh, there. Um, populace of the left will look at the same cities and be critical because of the divergence of, you know, elites, urban elites on the one hand and, and uh, people outside the, the mature parts of the advanced parts of the economy. Uh, in all of those situations, uh, what we think, we think that they point to real issues. But where the issues are, I mean, you know, one of the things Bruce and I have said a lot is we've gotten really good, and this is particularly true of universities and particularly true in the humanities, we've gotten really good at problem identification, and we've gotten really bad at solutions. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, you go to an urban studies thing or some urban, you know, they're just, they like, talk about, like, gentrification. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could be, like, in places that like, Lord knows you'd like some gentrification and they're like gentry, you know, they're like all over the place. But if you, but if you ask really tough questions about um, solutions, about supply of affordable housing, if you ask tough questions about economic growth and what you have to do to try to get higher levels of social mobility, those places are actually not well positioned to think about that. We were looking for those people, those places, those institutions that are taking all those issues on and trying to do them in really significant Let's ways. Let's talk about inequality so stop because right that's there, a just big piece of this agenda. One quick yeah. thing about the politics of this stuff because you can look at the U.S. vote, you could look at Brexit, you could look at the Catalonia secession, you could look at the, you know, the elections in Europe, in Eastern Europe. You know, so the cores of cities tend to be oriented one way, and then you have like urban and suburban counties where maybe it's a little bit in play. And as the further you go out is where you begin to, to see this incredible grievance yeah. mm -hmm. and a sense that you know, people and places have been left behind. This is very spatial. 
The, but here's, the, if there's one fact that anyone takes away from today, it's that 50% of people who live in rural America live within metropolitan areas. So it is within our control, if we have agency, if we have collective action, to say, let us now figure out the interdependencies of the core and the periphery. Because if we leave it up to the Democrats and the Republicans, look, they each have their bases, they will play to their bases, and they are not trying to actually unify the country, but metropolitan America could be trying to unify the urban and the rural within those, met within those envelopes. You know, the urban-rural divide in the United States, which explains so much of our, of our popular vote, is not Manhattan and you know, what we used to think of as Kansas. It's here mm -hmm. and 30 miles from here. Okay? Exactly. Well, shame on us if we can't figure out what those interdependencies and linkages look like. It's within our power to do that. And, I, and, and so I think we need to take a lot of what divides us in this country and begin to think about it in different spatial terms, or frankly in England or in Spain or other parts of the world that are going through the same disruption. Yeah, let's oh, so, sorry, no, no, sorry. no, no, yeah. let's dive into this urban inequality because yeah. I know that that's a big piece of the book, um, but it's also a piece of criticism that I've seen on the sure. book is that this nucleosum agenda could actually perpetuate more inequalities, deep in it, if you're relying on kind of yeah. that local action to really generate their own resources yeah, we and wrote their own it solutions. To perpetuate more inequality. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so can you talk through? Can you talk through? You know, both your chapter yeah. and your your vision for how this would help solve it, but also. Um, the, the critique that's out there? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, well no, let me just yeah. say one thing. So what we revert, if you, if you buy the book, and I should say buy the book, you know, we'll sign it. But if you buy the book, you'll see like right in the beginning, we say the last thing we're trying to do here is to say that there is not an important role for a federal government, yeah. including the role of the federal government in a strong social safety net and redistribution. The federal government is a platform that can do certain kinds of things and only can do certain kinds of things. So we're really clear in that. So one critique has been that we think there's no role in the federal government. We only have to go a couple pages in. We're clear that that's not, that's not so. Um, having said that, the question is, outside of redistribution, including health care, which we don't do very well, um, where does economic growth happen? And where does, um, where, where does social mobility happen? Where does it, you know, what's the wellspring of that? And it's largely local. I mean, value gets driven locally. Uh, local institutions run school systems. It's not, you know, I think nine or 10 cents on the dollar comes from the federal government. It's state and local. So if the biggest, if the biggest driver of social mobility is human capital, if the biggest driver of economic growth are the kinds of civic, private, public decisions that are made around certain sectors of the economy, then the question of economic growth and the question of attaching people outside of the labor market to the jobs that are being created, that's pretty local. And that's what we were trying to say. And so we looked at what that means in a Pittsburgh or a Philadelphia or an Indianapolis or somewhere else. There, there is a kind of, a, there's a, kind of a, 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 a bit of a fantasy out there that there is this mana from the federal government that is going to pour down and is going to transform cities. We never built cities that way. It's right. never the way cities were built, right? Mm -hmm. So we're trying to, in some ways, trying to uh, disabuse us from, the, from the, this kind of myth of the role of the federal government in city building and, and, and economic growth. Yeah, when the federal government tried to build cities back in the 50s, it just rammed highways yeah, right through the middle exactly. of our neighborhoods. I mean, I, so I, I would just build on what Jeremy said, which is uh, the most important thing we could be doing in this country right now is investing in the life cycle of children and young adults. Absolutely. That's the future of the nation. That's the future of the nation. So if you think about what all the academics and researchers have told us, you make this investment between zero to three, here's the kind of return on investment. If you make this investment between three to six, it begins to accumulate, right? Here's the return. If you make these kind of investments in K through 12, suddenly the achievement gap begins to go down. Well, who's gonna make these investments? The national government? They've never been in in this business. It's the local. It's the public, the corporate, the civic, and it's these new kind of institutional mechanisms where we capture some of the value of the growth in our places and put it towards investments in the future. We talk a lot about financing mechanisms because we think that urbanists 
now really need to get pretty sophisticated about this stuff. Be and because for a long time we were saying, oh, if, if only in the 2018 election the Democrats come back. You think the Democrats are going to be able to do investments in zero to three or three to six? I've got a bridge to sell you, you know? I mean, we've got to take responsibility for this stuff in our mature yeah. metropolitan area. Federal government is a healthcare is a healthcare company with an army, right? I mean, if you look at the budget, right? The most 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 uh, mid-sized philanthropies have more discretion than a cabinet secretary. So even if we had a different president than what we have now, it wouldn't be that as crazy, right? We would have that, okay? and we hopefully would be more secure and maybe some better things are happening. But the actual discretionary capacity of that government is limited. Now, you know, we're in Chicago, we're in Illinois, which are the case some ways, sadly, yeah. kind of ground zero for a lack of fiscal capacity. Right. Um, and so, you know, luckily, I suppose, there is no bankruptcy rules for the states, otherwise you'd be bankrupt. Right, uh, But if you look at your pension fund liabilities and other things, you have very little room to move. And every year, in fact, less money goes on to the public budget, right? Uh, be a public budget to pay for goods because of your, the overhang. Now, we can agree or disagree about why and whose fault it is and da-da-da. It simply is what it is. And so the question then becomes, since there's limitations to whether you can tax your way out of it, and I understand these are big questions in Chicago. Um, the question will be, where will money come from for high quality public goods, for infrastructure, for investing in kids, right? Yeah, no, for everything. So the I mean old game may be over. Yeah. And the question is, what's the new game? Yeah. And this book is about trying to understand our observations are about what we think is possible in the new game. That does not mean that you don't have to get your fiscal house in order, and I understand, I've looked at your, your data on your budgets, and I understand it's easier to say up here than to do. It's really, uh, some cities are doing a better job than others, but it is a huge issue. And so the issue, for example, of public asset corporations, like in, in, in Denmark, in Copenhagen, the reason things like that will become more um, interesting as we move forward over the next couple of years is because there may not be a lot of choices. Absolutely. There simply may not be a lot of choices. You've got to tell me where the, where the money comes from, right? G given the way we raise money for public goods at a local level. So. Yeah, no, let's talk through this because um, it's a huge emphasis, obviously, of the report and you also, or the book, and you talk about um, the necessary leadership for these uh, undertaking this, right? It, it, you yeah. come down to leaders a lot uh, to, to spearhead these initiatives. And when we look at mayors, they're often you know, already strapped to, to fund existing activities. And so the idea of investing in new stuff is always um, a, a huge stretch. Uh, what, uh, how do you break down the public assets? You said the private, you mentioned before that the US does private assets really well, yeah. but Europe is way ahead on the public. Let's talk through that now in greater detail. Well, the public is a really interesting question. What's the public, right? Because in the US, uh, if you go through the city of Chicago and Cook County, you've got the state, you've got the county, you've got a gazillion suburban municipalities, every couple blocks you got a municipality because we have the 13th century version of Britain here, you know, and then, then you've got the central city, and then you've got the school district. Oh, and then you have the Port Authority, the Airport Authority, the Redevelopment Fences Authority, the Stadium right. Authority. The, you know, we got a Mosquito Authorities. <laughs> I mean, I want to be the head of the Parking Authority. That, to me, when I come yeah, back in another where the life, cash is, that's right. where the cash is. But so we got a lot of authorities here. Not if we go carless, oh, right? Not, yeah. <laughs> carless. Oh, we forgot. Yeah. We can say that in other cities, but not in Chicago. Yeah, right. We forgot that. Yeah. Right. You're right. Oh, oops, right. oops. Oops. Right. Oops. <laughs> but you know, I, I, so we've got a lot of separate fiefdoms, and part of this is you know we're, we're coming to the tail end of a 75-year story in the United States after the end of the Second World War, where we began to create all these independent authorities, right? A lot of them were created to sort of carry out national programs, yep. title, who remembers the 50s, right? Um, so we now need leadership to either create new institutions or repurpose institutions so that we can capture the value. I mean, when the government builds a lot of infrastructure, up zones, it's creating value for the private sector. In Europe, they take a portion of that and they reinvest. And here we just privatize it. Here we just privatize it. And what we do do well, however, 
is harness private and civic capital, as they do in Indianapolis, as they do in St. Louis, as they've done in Pittsburgh, as they've done in Cincinnati, to make very clear and concrete investments in quasi-public or even public goods. So we need to be better at both. And that's going to require leadership, much more sophisticated understanding of what is not the traditional public finance. That's why we call it metro finance, because we have muni finance. We know what that is. Cities go to the capital markets. They raise money for infrastructure, yada, yada, yada. We're calling this new kind of finance metro finance. And that's an aggregation and deployment of public, private, and civic through very different kinds of institutions. We do have models, but now we have to adapt and adopt them across many cities. So, so two important points about that. One, I think, really interesting for Chicago. I mean, we, so, people, so cities that are doing this well, this kind of leadership, are exercising what we refer to as horizontal leadership more than vertical leadership. That is, um, they're working across sectors really well, right? Um, and some cities are better, and some mayors and some systems are better than others with that, right? Um, I think a second really important part of that is that cities, you know, Bruce just went through a long list of all the different public entities that would be in a city. What really strikes us is that most places can't really tell you, for example, what they owe, own. They can tell you what they owe. They can go, you know, you can look at the liability side of the balance sheet. But actually, you can't really, it's really hard to get a handle on the asset side of the public balance sheet. Let alone can you understand the market value of what they own. Let alone could you understand if you had a return on that assets a greater return on those assets by, say, 10 basis points or 20 basis points, what would it mean for the budget, for the profit and loss statement? So many of you, some of you may have read a great book by Dag Detter and Stefan Foster, a couple of economists in Europe, wrote a book called The Public Wealth of, of Cities, where they really sort of took this apart. They looked at Copenhagen, looked at a whole bunch of places. We think most places don't actually understand their balance sheet. And that where you want to start with this is you want to start with a level of transparency and you want to put it, and, and by the way, we're not, we're not, this isn't a book that's asking for private, privatization. We're not at all there. Right. You know, some things could be privatized, some things could be, read. this is not about that at all. We actually want to increase sort of public wealth, but you can't increase public wealth if it's run in a mediocre way. You know, we have gotten ourselves ideologically into a, into a kind of rock and a hard place. On the right, it's only markets and privatization. On the left, it's only government. And, and that's not going to do it, right? Because one, and because it just, it doesn't, you know, you've got one group protecting one thing and another group saying, just get rid of it. Can you give some examples of like the hidden assets that some cities are now tapping sure. into? Bruce? God, the assets can, yeah. are just ridiculous. Incredible. I mean, I, I, yeah. I mean the easy stuff, um, I, 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 I called the mayor of Pittsburgh and the county executive in Allegheny County. So Pittsburgh's about 300,000. Allegheny County's a million. I said, could, could you just have some of your folks just drive me around and just show me stuff you own? You know, I mean, I, I don't, just, just you decide, I'm not going to sort of steer this in any direct way. Because again, yeah. there's no way of knowing what anyone owns in the United <laughs> right. States, I mean, what the government owns. I mean, Europe, it's fairly transparent. It's since the Romans, I mean, you know, yeah. but U.S., it's a little difficult. So they took me to this massive parcel where the sanitation trucks go to park at night. Massive parcel along one of the, the rivers. Across the street is Robot Row. I mean, Uber has their facility there. They're te they, you know, we're testing autonomous vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this is one of the great sort of, you know, uh, reinvention of Pittsburgh. Off of Carnegie Mellon, off of Pitt. I mean, they now have a first mover position in robotics and autonomous vehicles and machine learning and data analytics and all these companies are growing. And across the street is Garbage a trucks. huge sanitation parcel. I think it's worth a little bit more. Um, and, but the, the real issue is not just to sell it to whichever company is willing to spend, you know, pay the highest price. It's to put it into a portfolio that is managed by a publicly owned, privately driven corporation 
so you can begin to get that yield from these back incredible the assets back for the public over the long haul. It's a completely different way of thinking. You know, when we started writing the book, I was watching this movie. I don't know how many people have seen The Martian with Matt Damon. I was like obsessed with this movie. I mean, I don't know why. I mean, but you know, you, some really stupid movies just like take part of your head and you know, all you can do is sort of watch them again and again and again like a two year old. Um, and the end of the movie, Matt Damon is like teaching a class. He's come back to earth, you know. And he basically said, you know, someone says, well, how'd you get back, you know? And he says, well, you do the math. You solve one problem, then you solve another problem, then you solve another problem, and then you get to come home. Here's the problem we have in the U.S. Over the next decade, we have to invest $3 trillion in our children, in young adults, in infrastructure, in the commercialization of research, in startup and scale. You can see the math. $3 trillion. That's conservative. It's probably higher. Without a national government that has a clue and with states that are basically broke. So a lot of what this book was about was just reverse engineering. How do you get to $3 trillion? How do you get to $3 trillion? I mean... You get the three trillion by basically taking the Northern European and Asian models around public assets and adapting it to us, and then harnessing private and civic wealth in a radically different way in the United States. You can get the three trillion. You can't get it for everyone in the, every place in the country. That's why, in theory, you have a national government or states. But you can get it for a lot of places. But we just have to stop thinking that someone's going to save us. They're not going to save us. Well, do you want to yeah. talk about the opportunity zones? Because that was kind of oh, built sure. in. Your, you seem to be pretty excited about that little piece of the Well, as plan. you can tell, I can get very <laughs> excited about a lot of things. Um, but, um, including the Martian. Including the Martian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, I should have brought that up. <laughs> no, 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 it's all right. And right. then move into opportunity. Yeah, right, exactly, exactly. And we are going to turn to questions yeah, from everyone sure. so we can um, So in the rubble of this national government, <laughs> um, there's a silver lining, right? I mean, basically, in the tax bill, there's a small provision that was sponsored by Senator Cordy Booker, former mayor of Newark, and Republican Tim Scott of South Carolina, former member, ma uh, member of the Charleston City Council, County Council, um, called the Investing in Opportunity Act. And what they basically have come up with is a tax incentive where if you have unre you know, realized capital gains and you want to defer paying taxes, you can basically put those capital gains into an opportunity fund, and that fund can invest in opportunity zones which have been designated by the governors, right? And these are basically new market tax credit eligible. You see, it could get real boring very fast. Basically, low income, low and moderate income neighborhoods. But this is a tax incentive that basically says, to investors, let's try to match all this capital that's sitting on the sidelines to investable propositions in low and moderate income neighborhoods. Now, a lot of low and moderate income neighborhoods in the United States are in near downtown areas of cities like Louisville or South Bend or Oklahoma City or St. Louis. Or, I mean, there are whole cities that qualify for this particular tax incentive, right? So this is a really interesting potential for us to take market capital and begin to match it to investable propositions. And then if we're really smart, we'll then complement those market investments with investments in schools and skills. Absolutely. That's not what this federal tax incentive said. It didn't say like empowerment zones, do everything. It just said, here's a way of matching market capital to investments. But what we're putting forward is the proposition that cities can be purposeful and intentional about this. And first of all, unveil their assets. Don't just talk about your deficits, right, through a gazillion regression analyses. Just let's talk about our assets. Let's begin to identify those investable projects. And then let's make social investments in what we know has to happen, particularly starting in the early ages on up. You know, it's a 10-year effort, right? If you put it in a fund for 10 years, you don't pay. You defer your payment on capital gains, but if there's an appreciation in the investments from the fund, you don't pay any capital gains on that. And so imagine there's an eight-year-old living in one of these low-income neighborhoods. In 10 years, they'll be 18, potentially could be entering the labor market or going to community college or to a four-year. We should be thinking in, you know, this is a, an effort that gives us the ability to think in the semi-long term. 
Well, one of so, the interesting yeah, things about yeah. it, I would just well, say, is and that, on that, can you also incorporate the the gentrification case against you know these codes or that you're just gentrifying sure. neighborhoods and sure, just sure, comment sure. on that because there is um, some concern. Sure. Look, yeah, yeah. So, so one thing I would say that what what was really interesting it kind of gets to the gentrification issue. So, what was interesting about it is that governors had to choose from among they could only put forward 25 percent of the eligible. Uh, zones. They could, there was also a provision that up to 5% could be contiguous. I won't go on that. But what was interesting about that is that because you had to choose, so some states were really remarkably thoughtful and some mayors were really remarkably thoughtful in consultation where they used really high quality data and they had behind what they were putting forward not only a uh, perspective about social need, which is a huge a huge part of this, but they also had a perspective about the interplay of social need and where there's some market traction, right? So what was interesting about the selection is that if you did this, if you, if you did this the right way, which is you were pretty deliberative about it, it revealed some kind of, I mean, for lack of a better term, a kind of theory about it. Now there's this other way of doing it, which is um, uh, the governor's people call the head of every city and the head of every county and say, give me the zones you want, and then we horse trade and we go back and we get that. Some of that always is going to happen, but some places were much more intentional about it than others, right? The interesting thing, and maybe the good, the bad, and the ugly of this credit, will be that um, it is very market-driven. So this isn't a credit that is given out by like the low-income housing tax credit gets given out by the state housing finance agencies. New market tax credits get, get provided, are provided by the Treasury Department's CDFI program. Historic tax credits have a compliance regimen related to historic uh, properties. This, theoretically, uh, Bruce and I could create the, the NOAC and CATS Opportunity Fund, and if we got investors, and as long as we invested 90% of our money into those, into qualified zones, uh, we could, that would be fine. And the only point of compliance is really the IRS, whether the IRS is going to say to the taxpayer, you're, you're fine, you get, the, you, get the, uh, you get the relief. So the good news, the, the really, so the, the good news about it being market driven is that there's not a lot of barriers to entry, right? You can just put, put something together really quickly. The downside is it won't necessarily safeguard, and you can invest it there. Are, look, the, the regs aren't out yet, so we don't really know. So once the regs come out, we'll know more about it. But the downside of something that is so market-driven might be that there are no safeguards for certain kinds of products or certain kinds of investments that you don't think will reach those social goals. That means that places, public sector, civil society, investors, philanthropies, others, ought to take this really seriously and ought to figure out how they put in motion something, including with their potential investors through their, through their networks, something that will create the kind of value that we want to create mm -hmm. there. So it can be a problem or it can be a really good thing. That's in some ways the definition of markets, right? Mm -hmm. And the question is what will civil society do in order to steer it in a particular direction. Just one thing, we more, do want pla to take questions from more places yeah. need gentrification in the United States than not. Right. Not every place is, is Seattle or right. Boston or San Francisco or even the core of Denver, the core of, this gentrification issue has, has basically lost any you know, sense of gravity. It's like, it's, it's taking the hottest markets and, 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 and what is a serious market dynamic that is displacing people and pushing people out of the core cities and even the urban counties, and it's applying it across the entire country. That's not we're, we're, you know, We are a very large place with an enormous variation, and we need to take this incentive and other efforts as a way to understand the reality of different places. Yeah. And one goal would obviously be for the people yeah. who have been living there and long-time residents yeah. to be able to benefit from those but, improvements. But, the yeah. but let's open this up, because yeah, I know our group, we have about 15 minutes, really lots of questions from our audience here today. Um, there's microphones that are coming around, and we're gonna just start right here with um, this lady in the third row, please. If we stay, say anything you don't like, we still think you should buy our book. 
by the way. And please keep your questions brief. Or multiple brief. copies. Or multiple copies, right. Burn please it. keep your questions brief. We'll try to get a lot of got my attention with the idea about reinvesting capital gains into community development institutions. And here in Chicago, for example, we've got Benefit Chicago. You know, yep. we've got um, yep. Urban Partnership Bank. Are these types of institutions already existing? You already said that regs haven't been, haven't been written. What do we need to do to be tracking this to find out where those qualifying investments are going to be because they already exist in certain ways so, on the ground right here in Chicago? Yeah, so your, your governor, I assume, submitted, I, this I don't know, I assume submitted the, the tracks to the federal government. And I assume then you should know sometime soon what tracks are eligible, right? I mean, in the rest of the country, people know what tracks are eligible. And it was actually in some places, it was actually a remarkably transparent uh, process. I don't know how it worked here, right? Um, but so, so you should be able to find out sometime soon. Uh, it, had, it was due, you got an extension. It was due the third week of April? It was due April 20th. April 20th, so it was already done. So you should know what are the, now you've got institutions like Benefit Chicago, you know, plenty of institutions yeah, yeah. here that are high quality intermediaries that, you know, in the case of, you know, where you've got, you know, networks of investors who are used to trying to figure out how to utilize private capital in market driven ways that still have a public good attached to it, right? In many ways, Chicago has been one of the really remarkable R&D places for trying to work in that gray area between market discipline and public good, right? Yeah. So you really are well positioned to do this and figure this out uh, with the institutions and with the network of investors you have. Uh, what we're doing right now in a couple of cities is helping people figure it out. You've got the sophistication here around this that it should be a no-brainer, I yeah, Absolutely. Uh, I don't know. I'm not from here, so I don't know what state. Has your state, do you know what your, what your, what is that? Yeah. Yeah, right. it'll, it'll be. It'll, it'll be. be it'll, you'll, you'll know pretty soon. And the re I don't think regs will be written until like the fall. The fall. So you've got, you've got time. We have time to mess it up. Yeah, so we've got. Let's get a question um, over there in the back corner. I'm from Colombia, South America, um, and I'm looking for answers and solving problems. Is there a room for localism, for the new localism in the developing world? Yeah. We are struggling on issues, of, and we have fiscal deficits, but we are struggling with war, with big issues uh, for development. So I just have that question. I think, I, you know, I, Latin America is a very large place, and I, 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 so I think part of the answer, if we go to Chile, you know, Chile still has a highly centralized government. Um, the, the governors and mayor are like appointed. I mean, so they really have not devolved power down. It's like Britain in Latin America to a large extent, right? So I, I think we almost have to go country to country and look at Governmental power, which is usually a question about devolution and what's been devolved and what hasn't, and then market and civic power. A lot of our book is about thinking about power in much more multi-layered and complex ways. It's not just a question of have, have higher levels of government begun to devolve down, either de facto or de jure. It's whether have cities like Santiago or Bogota or Buenos Aires understood they have true market and civic power. If they think of themselves as networks and not as governments. And then you begin to get into some of these interesting institutional mechanisms, like we talk about in the book, so that you can unlock capital and find other sources of revenue to invest in what's important. So I think we need an audit, really, throughout the world of these different kinds of power yeah. and whether they're understood, really, in different places. Um, and then once you understand them, then you can move down some of these different paths. So I'm going to Colombia for a month next year, and I, there have been actually some remarkable mayors recently in Colombia, in, um, in Cali and in, in Medellin. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but I don't know the answer to that, but I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to find out. So, okay. you know. <laughs> um, right back there, please. 
one of the things that uh, we've had uh, in the United States with uh, making localism bigger has been annexation. So yeah, we have yeah. annexation in Kansas City, Oklahoma City. Uh, this has basically hurt people of color and, and hurt their, their representation. What do we do about that? Well, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a pro and a con here, right? And I think we need to understand the pro. When you annex the way that some of these cities have annexed, you create a much larger fiscal shed. Uh, and in some places, you actually create an opportunity, like in Louisville, yeah. when they consolidate the city. Jefferson County. In Jefferson yeah. County. The city and the county consolidated, but the school district was already consolidated because of 1970s civil rights legislation. In theory, some of these larger geographies begin to get closer to how the market actually operates, because the organic unit of the economy is the metropolitan area. So you create this large fiscal shed, and if you're smart and strategic about it, you begin to make the kind of investments back into disadvantaged places, back into people who actually need the help. Not every place does this, right? But part of the issue that we have is we have, you know, we're in the land of fragmentation here. I mean, you've got 554 you know, municipalities in your metropolis. It's absolutely insane. But we can also be in the land of dilution. Well, I, you know, the question is what's your starting point, you know? And how do you take your starting point and either you know, make the consolidation moves you make or make the reinvestment moves you make or find another alternative? But you know, there's no perfect system to be from. I mean, that's what's amazing about the United States. I mean, every variation you have from the sublime to the ridiculous is here. <laughs> you know? I mean, you know, we have it. We have, we're all creatures of state law really, at the municipal level and at the county level. So we have this crazy variance, right? But I, I think we now have to basically begin to, to our, again, do the math. What kind of investments do we need to make in our future? Because higher levels of government, like Elvis, have left the building, and they're not coming back. <laughs> Let's just assume that as a starting point. If anything intelligent happens, so, yeah. Uh, I, I think it's a mix. I think it's a mix. I, 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 well, I was part of the city-county merger in Louisville. That was not about diluting voting power. That was about survival in a global economy. It was literally about how to survive. Yeah, and we you see know. cities around the world yeah. that are um, a, a annexing yeah. their suburban areas. Sure. I have a question that came in on our, um, our, our digital platform here um, that actually does a nod back to the gentrification case um, with booming metropolises or even the urban areas and that are not kind of the big global cities across the country. Um, if the communities start to increase in value, they also um, became a, become more unaffordable for members that are living there. So what are your proposals? And I think this might have to be our last question, but sure. um, what are your proposals for keeping those communities affordable um, as they as they improve. So just, just as a start, and then, you know, Jeremy spent 30 years financing this stuff, so we, you know, but just as a start, the United States localized education and nationalized housing policy. It's we crazy. did the opposite of what the rest of the world it's insane. did. It's crazy. Right. So the notion that when we have an affordable housing problem, which we do, not in every place, and frankly, I think it's actually in a smaller number of our metropolitan areas than people understand, we immediately say, if only the national government would do better. Folks, ain't going to happen. So we have to basically, as we've done with public asset corporations, begin to understand how does Hamburg do this? How does Copenhagen do this? How does Stockholm do this? Because these are places where housing policy is localized. And the way they do it is they take every single element of housing production and preservation and they break it down into land use, into zoning, into codes, into subsidy, into you know, market capital. And they begin to say, okay, and in, they begin to say, how are we going to ensure that we keep the, our community not completely static, it's gonna be dynamic, but reflecting our values and reflecting, you know, um, the, the notion that people should participate. We, we have spent decades thinking the national government's in charge of housing policy. So not surprising, we don't have the tools yet to respond. But Jeremy's gonna tell you how we're gonna do that. 
No, so the first thing, uh, I mean, it's a great question, and we don't have all the answers, obviously, but the first thing is to have a real clarity on the data to understand the nature of the problem. So in most places where I work, the problem is uh, for long-time homeowners is the increase in taxes. And for renters, it's the increased scarcity of affordable rental housing. So one is a scarcity issue, which you have to address, address head on uh, through production and through how you allocate your credits. And whether you, if you're a strong city with lots of development opportunities, whether you create some kind of, a, you know, some mechanisms to uh, capture that and to make sure that there's, you know, whether it's 80-20 or 70-30, what you do for uh, mixed income housing. Uh, in for long-time homeowners who often uh, actually are capturing the value of gentrification, um, uh, the question is, are there mechanisms, policy mechanisms, and the availability of these policy mechanisms changes state by state, city by city, depending on sort of laws around taxation? Are there mechanisms you can have to keep those taxes lower or to only increase gradually over a period of time? So the Federal Reserve in Philadelphia my old haunt, uh, just put out a, a really interesting study on the effect of tax policy, which tried to deal with that in Philadelphia, in gentrifying areas in Philadelphia. And it was remarkably successful uh, to ke of keeping low-income or moderate-income homeowners uh, in the community. The, the complicated thing about gentrification on all this is to make sure that you know what issue you're trying to solve for, and what the data actually says. There are some studies, and by the way, it's quite ambiguous. There are lots of studies that show different things. But you know, if you look at Freeman's studies out of New York, and, and you look at some studies that the Fed has done in a few places, um, in some gentrifying areas, low-income people actually are moving less. The gentrification actually keeps lower-income people to want to stay more than then the actual, the actual rate of low-income people moving from place to place is pretty because of their instability, and particularly the lowest end of the labor market and rental markets is pretty significant. If any of us, if you've, if you've ever done work with school data and you just sort of watch and follow school data where people are moving from place to place, it's actually quite remarkable and I think really strikes you how destabilizing it can be. So there's, depending on the context, there's, there's evidence that certain kinds of market movements up, trajectories up, are actually helpful for keep maintaining low-income people. I know that sounds, that sounds counter to what we're supposed to think, except in some instances, that's what the data shows. And so it's a really interesting, so I always say this, and, and I think, so I'll use Philadelphia because it's an example I know a lot of. Um, of its 360-some census tracts, about 10% of them have had some level of gentrification in the last 10 or 15 years. The, but 40 or 50% of the census in census tracts have gotten poorer. So the major problem is not gentrification. The major problem is poverty. Yeah. And the major problem for gentrification is not so much displacement as a reduction in the number of affordable rental units, but only in those particular tr tracts. So the most important thing to do is to not let the heat of the issue obscure the light of what the data is telling you so that you know you're trying to solve for the right problem. Um, and I think there's where it gets very complicated. And in many ways, I think some of our academic institutions have done us a disservice by not being thoughtful enough about uh, the use of yeah. data. I'm tweeting that. Things. That's a good line, actually. <laughs> so that's pretty yeah. well to hear. Well, actually, we, we are coming back up I'm on sorry, our time. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go on too, too long. Um, so we're going to wrap up on time, but just in the last two minutes here, you guys can each have 60 seconds. Um, what was kind of the mo you've been out pushing this book already for, for quite some time, um, since January, right, in the release. Yeah. You said uh, different audiences, different contexts, have, you've gotten um, different feedback, and some of it has, yeah, I think you even said the word offensive um, in, in one conversation. So I'd love to know just very briefly, um, contextually, what you've heard that surprised you or what has been embraced, and uh, if you could both very briefly in any closing thoughts, and then we'll wrap up on time. Well, I'm, you know, I, I, I think I've actually thought that I should spend a lot more time sort of reading, you know, psychological literature, because I think a lot of what has <laughs> happened in the U.S. is that we've grown up in a regime over decades 
where we were taught that we live in a hierarchy and we actually live in a network society. And so I think the, the I think most of what has happened as we've gone around is, and you know, I've been through this in the first book, and now this is you know Metro Revolution, now new localism. It's much more specific, and the person in the White House is absolutely insane. So I I, I think people are finally coming to the realization we are the solution. That everything we taught, you know, we taught from an early age that we look up for solutions is not true in this country. This is de Tocqueville in America circa 2018. We are a network society with so many of the solutions here. And we now have to recognize it and we have to organize for it and we have to institutionalize it. And I th so most of what I've heard is, is this sense of realization and recognition and then, oh my God, you know, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? We don't have the intermediaries. We don't have the, you know. So it, it's, it's both liberating and sobering simultaneously. Right. Yeah. Quickly, final thought. Um, so the, for me, the most heartening thing has been that there is a hunger in this country for uh, pragmatism yeah. and for getting things done. And uh, I think people are starting to get tired on both sides of the excessive nature of partisanship and kind of tired narratives that are there and are trying to now. So I, now maybe it's because I've been hanging out a lot in places like Oklahoma City and Kansas and Louisville and you know and and just talking to you know more. Maybe it's been more plain spoken, but this is even all kinds of neighborhoods, all kinds of places, all kinds of ethnic backgrounds. I think there's like actually a great hunger for to try to figure out how to be effective again. And I think maybe maybe the insanity of, of the recent politics has sort of driven us to that. But that's actually been quite heartening to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great timing on the book. There's a line in here. Uh, this is how to rebuild nations and repair the world from the ground up. So that one echoed with me. Um, thank you to our speakers. Thank you all for being here today. There, uh, their book is on sale, and um, they'll be signing books as well if you want to uh, meet them and talk to them over there. Um, thank you all for being here. That was here. a great line. <laughs> we can't let.